welcome to the last Massey Dialogues of this season. I'm delighted to invite you to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. Bienvenue. Massey College is located on Indigenous land, the land of the Yarnwanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge their stewardship of the land and the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Today, we're going to talk about something that could not be more topical, Canada-China relationship in higher education. It's in the news this week. And we're so fortunate that we have among us a visiting scholar that is a specialist of the question. So I wanna thank Professor Jaw for actually bringing forward this idea of the dialogue and also putting a fabulous panel together. So without further ado, I'm going to give it to Professor Jaw. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal De Rosiers. Uh, my name is Chang Zha, and I'm Associate Professor at York University Faculty of Education, and currently a visiting scholar to the Massey College. I shall serve as the mod uh, moderator uh, of this event. Uh, this event is hosted by the Massey College at the University of Toronto, and also supported by uh, Canada-China Initiatives Fund at York University. Uh, first of all, um, I wish you man uh, support us by hitting uh, like this video, and also uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, now let me uh, introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, joining us today are Drs. Daniel Bell, Ruth Heiho, and Chen Tang. I'm presenting them in the alphabetic order. Professor Daniel Bell is originally from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, he was educated at McGill University and Oxford University. He's currently Dean of School Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University in China, and a professor um, in Tsinghua University um, in the Schwarzman College and uh, uh, the Department of Philosophy. In addition, he has held research fellowships at Princeton University Center for Human Values, Stanford University Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, and Hebrew University Department of Political Science. He has authored and co-authored numerous books, uh, including East Meets West, Human Rights and Democracy in East Asia, published in 2000, Beyond Liberal Democracy, Political Thinking for an East Asian Context, published in 2006, and China's New Confucianism, Politics and Everyday Life in a Changing Society, published 2010. The Spirit of Cities, Why the Identity of a City Matters in a Global Age, and the China, uh, published in 2011. The China Model, a Political Meritocracy and Limits of Democracy, published 2015. And the new book, the very latest volume, Just Hierarchy, Why Social Hierarchies Matter in China and the Rest of the World, just published 2020. These books all published by the Princeton University Press. Um, Professor Bell will bring to us his perspective on Chinese universities through the lens of Canadian values. Our second um, panelist, um, Professor uh, Ruth Heiho, teaches at University of Toronto. Uh, her Asian engagements have included the first secretary for education Science, Culture in the Canadian Embassy in Beijing uh, from 1989 to 1991. Also a visiting professor at uh, Lagoya University in Japan in 1996, and director of the Hong Kong Institute of Education, which is now the Education University of Hong Kong from 1997 to 2002. Her recent books include um, China Through the Lens of Comparative Education, published 2015, Canadian Universities in China's Transformation, an Untold Story, 2016, and Religion and Education, 2018. From uh, 80, uh, 1989 to 2001, Professor Heiho led two uh, projects supported by, at that time, Canadian International Development Agency, or CEDA, under the Canada-China University Linkages Program, for joint doctor training in education with six Chinese normal universities. 
than for collaborative research with the Chinese universities on moral education, woman education, bilingual and minority education. Her experience in Beijing from 1989 to 1991 and in Hong Kong from 1997 to 2001 to his return to China, gave her a profound awareness of the importance of education and culture communications in a time of geopolitical tensions. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Chen Tang studied in Canada from 1979 to 1985 at the University of Windsor where he uh, earned his master's degree in physiology and a PhD in biology. Dr. Tang then joined the Chinese embassy in Ottawa as the first secretary responsible for promoting academic relations between China and Canada. He returned to China in 1989 and worked in the Ministry of Education in Beijing as division director and the Shanxi provincial government. Dr. Tang joined UNESCO in 1993 and it was appointed to a number of senior posts at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. In 2010, he was appointed as the Assistant Director General for Education, leading UNESCO's sector of education until his retirement in 2018. Doc Tang will bring to us not only an educational bilateral perspective, but also a multilateral perspective with respect to Canada-China higher education relations. So welcome, Doctors Bell, Heho, and Tao. Um, now I Thank you. just uh, before uh, we start the dialogue, I need to <coughs> spend a few minutes to lay out the context uh, for this dialogue. I I think um, it's necessary to mention um, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Canada is among the earliest major Western countries that established a formal relationship with China. Canada is the first major Western country that aided upgrading China's higher education system in the early years of China's reform era. Uh, that is uh, in the later 1970s and 1990, until 1990s. Through the uh, major uh, CEDA projects across many discipline, disciplines, such as uh, uh, management, uh, health, engineering, education, environment, agriculture, uh, community development, international relations, uh, which were pivotal uh, to China's social and economic development thereafter. And those projects uh, build up the maximum human and institutional contacts between Canada and China in those key areas for chi uh, China's developmental needs. And aimed high at a multi a multiplication of contacts at the thinking level. That was a quotation uh, from the project documents. As such, Canada um, was not matched by any other country at that time in terms of supporting capacity building for Chinese universities, supporting uh, their curricular development and human resource development. Second, um, the early year one-way traffic in the form of educational aid has now evolved into a two-way traffic between Canada and China, uh, whereby Canada has been benefiting from the bilateral education relations. Uh, China is now a major source of Canada's international students. China is now the home to more than one-third of the global middle class. And this pandemic has so uh, they have this Chinese middle class has so far suffered the least erosion in the pandemic, uh, according to a, a Pew uh, Research Center analysis. Thus, it's likely China will return its position as a top source of international students in the post-pandemic era. Chinese students uh, make not only the academic financial contributions to Canadian universities, but also the potential skilled immigrants to Canada. Besides, uh, Canadian universities now have increasing research ties with the Chinese counterparts, uh, which are emerging as a global powerhouse in knowledge uh, production and advancement, as evident in global rankings of research performance and outcomes. Third, um, the current uh, geopolitical shifts have ushered in the tensions and the rivalries 
between the West and China, particularly uh, between the US and China, which in turn could lead to decoupling between the two countries, including university exchange and collaboration. The American politicians now see China as posing a whole of society threat to the US, and even said, and here I'm quoting President Trump, almost every student who comes over to this country from China is a spy. So most recently, the US legislation has been pushing forward the Atlas Frontier Act, which will serve as the legislative vehicle to counter China in a variety of areas, including uh, university exchange and the research collaboration in science and technology. Presumably, other Western countries will follow suit. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the Alberta uh, government in Canada has taken a step forward um, a day or two days ago uh, by requesting the province uh, universities to pause any new partnerships with the links to the Chinese government and to review the existing relationships. Uh, finally, uh, we have some colleagues uh, arguing for the ontological openness in science and a global uh, research network taking advantage of the epistemic diversity to boost knowledge production and advancement. And they described the networked global science as, a, let me quote um, Professor Simon Margins from Oxford University, um, the networked global science as a dynamic open communication system, autonomous, evolving endogenously, an emerging organization is in its own right. Furthermore, open science has been crucial for forging common knowledge goods in relation to the shared human problems. Thus, they advocate the reason for booming international scientific collaboration and emphasize sustained and dynamic interconnections between different epistemic traditions in an effort to create an ecology of knowledges in the place of the monoculture of modern science. So those are things I want to highlight uh, as the components of the, um, the context uh, of this uh, dialogue. Uh, they are key components uh, for sure. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite the panelists uh, to provide their opening statements. Uh, I shall go with the uh, alphabetic order uh, Again, so I would like to invite uh, Professor Daniel Bell uh, to speak a few words first. Um, thank you for the uh, kind invitation. It's a great honor to be part of this panel. And actually, um, higher education exchange is not really my academic specialty, but I can speak mainly from my own personal experience um, living in and teaching in China for well, now nearly 20 years. Um, when I was at teaching at Tsinghua University, um, I often sent my students to do, uh, it was, there was lots of support from, actually from the Chinese government for students to go abroad. So my field is political theory. Um, and I would send my students to Canada often to study for a year with theorists such as Will Kimlicka at, at Queen's University. Um, and they often engaged in what we would call somewhat politically sensitive areas, but there was never a problem in those days. Um, I worry now, uh, given the current climate, that it would be much more difficult to do that. My current post is at Shandong University, and it's the leading university in Shandong province, um, which has about 100 million people. We have great students um, who lack exposure to uh, the rest of the world compared to uh, students in, to, from Beijing or Shanghai. So part of my mission is to internationalize and to set up student exchanges. And I have set up student exchanges in Norway, for example, which go very well, where the students learn about um, uh, Nordic culture and, and the students from Norway learn about Chinese culture. I was hoping to set up similar arrangements in Canada in the future. Of course, that has all come to an end I mean, temporary uh, end or postponement, I should say, because of COVID. But I very much hope that my students at Shandong University can have some 
uh, links with Canada. And of course, I also hope to welcome students from Canada, although frankly, um, there's not much interest from Canada in, in that respect at the moment because, well, China is so demonized often in the Chinese media, sorry, in the Canadian media, and it, it, so not as many students from Canada probably want to come to China anymore. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Professor Ruth Hehu. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here at this very special dialogue. Canada-China educational cooperation and mutual reciprocal learning has been the story of my life. I began in 1967 as a young graduate of University of Toronto who moved to Hong Kong. I watched China through the Cultural Revolution, learning Cantonese and then Mandarin, and then I moved to Shanghai in 1980 to teach the first group of students after the Cultural Revolution from 80 to 82 at Fudan University. Uh, later, I worked in the Canadian Embassy, and then finally, when I came back to Canada, I was very involved with Canada's projects in China. It was so exciting when I came back in 1984 to find an agreement had been signed for development aid with a focus on education and a huge project to support China's universities redevelopment after the Cultural Revolution under the then Canadian International Development Agency. I was involved in the overall project design and uh, planning and one of the principles was to really listen to what the Chinese were looking for and wanting. And I also managed a project in um, joint training in education. We trained about uh, 15 to 20 uh, doctoral students in Chinese normal universities and also our doctoral students spent time in China learning for their doctoral work um, in Canada. At that time, Dr. Tang was at the Canadian Embassy, so a Chinese Embassy in Ottawa. So he was also involved in the discussions and arrangements for these collaborative projects, which went on from, I think, starting in about 1984 with management, then a big project in 88, and then running right through till 2002 uh, or so, when China was becoming so prosperous that it didn't need development aid to the same extent and in the same ways. My biggest surprise learn to appreciate and value their experience. I'm sorry, I think, am I lost? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, just uh, I'm back. a few seconds. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I got knocked yeah. out. But uh, at first, when I started the projects in the middle 80s, I got back to Canada in 84. People in my university said, what would we have to learn from China? Why should we bother? Once we started and our professors got involved, going to China, visiting, having conference and negotiation, they kept knocking on my door. When can I join the project? I see how much there is to learn. So that was the joy of that work, the recognition across Canada of all that could be learned from a country of such rich civilization, even though at the time it was uh, economically not so prosperous and suffering from the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. So it's my pleasure to be here and share these experiences today. Thank you, Dr. Heho. Uh, so now uh, we move to uh, this dialogue. Uh, to facilitate this dialogue, we have uh, five uh, preset uh, questions. I don't have any uh, uh, statement. Oh, so sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Tao. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, my apology, uh, please. Yeah, naturally, we'll move to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to say, I do admire the courage of Dr. Cha and also Massey College. Uh, when you initiate this uh, dialogue on the academic relation between Canada and China in this rather cold geopolitical environment. So thank you for inviting me to join this panel. Uh, I was uh, one of the first uh, Chinese students sent by the Chinese government to study in Canada uh, in 1979. And um, my experience uh, in Canada, quite similar like uh, Professor Hayho's experience in China. I spent six years uh, uh, as a graduate student and then four years uh, as the diplomats in the Chinese embassy in Ottawa promoting uh, uh, bilateral um, uh, educational cooperation exchanges. Uh, I, uh, I consider myself very lucky as I personally witnessed the first uh, honeymoon 
period of the academic uh, cooperation between the two countries, uh, when the wish to for cooperation from both sides uh, were very sincere. And uh, I think this 10 years cooperation was one of the most significant factors for developing a strong economic tie uh, between the two countries in the years uh, follow, to follow. So for me, uh, this was uh, 10 years uh, with a lot of uh, pleasant memories. And um, so I'm delighted to join this platform uh, along with the Professor Heiho, uh, whom I know her by name and by work for decades. And also, of course, Professor Bell, who have a, a deep understanding for the higher education system of both countries. Uh, I hope our discussion can provide some input to the effort of a restoring the trust and the cooperation between the two countries, uh, academia, and uh, as we know, the decoupling would not good for any of us. So that's my uh, statement at the beginning. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, all the panelists and Dr. Tell, my apology again. Uh, as I said, we have uh, uh, a few uh, preset questions to facilitate this dialogue. And after that, uh, we have, um, we're gonna open the floor and uh, welcome questions from the audience. So uh, we go through the five uh, preset questions um, together. Uh, first question um, I have here, the, uh, what historical opportunities have endowed Canadian universities with a unique experience in terms of working with Chinese counterparts? Uh, what lesson and legacy come from this history? May I uh, uh, invite Professor Heho to respond to this question first? Uh, thank you. It's really my pleasure just to say a word so much Canadian University benefited from their involvement in those 15 years in education. There was so much to learn in agriculture, the development of canola as a health giving oil that in China drew millions out of poverty who were working in rural areas and in Canada became a very important export in health, in this uh, study and treatment of cancer and oncology. So many areas, it was just quite dramatic and it evolved into ongoing cooperation in many cases. i uh, just give the example, Waterloo University and Nanjing University still doing significant collaboration with the Sino-Canadian co uh, College in, uh, in uh, Environment. I think that's enough for me to say. Let me hear from some of the others. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Heho. Yeah, Dr. Tang, uh, you are also uh, involved uh, that part of history. Can we listen to you? Well, yes, of course, um, it's good just to recall the history. Uh, I think right after China opens the door after the Cultural Revolution, and they decide to send uh, the so-called visiting scholars and the graduate students to study in foreign countries. I think even at that time, Canada was uh, one of the most favorite country uh, to go to, as uh, Professor Cha just uh, mentioned. I think basically for Chinese people at that time, China, Canada um, has uh, excellent universities. Uh, they have a friendly professors and the people. And uh, in Canada, there's a less political oriented uh, environment as compared with the United States. And of course, the warm feeling of the Chinese society towards Canada is another factor. Uh, as uh, we all know, uh, Canada is one of the first major Western country established a diplomatic relation with China. And of course, not to mention the name of Dr. Norman Bethune. So uh, the Canadian professors, what I, my experience during that time uh, as pro, a student and also as a diplomat, I found out uh, all Canadian professors are very friendly towards their Chinese students. They want to help, very, very nice. And when I was a diplomat, I frequently, frequently contact the officials, Canadian government from foreign affairs, external affairs, uh, our AUCC, they all share I think their government's a good wish to help China and the Chinese students. I think later on, all visiting scholars uh, returned to China during those 10 years, and they became a, a very major uh, force to drive the modernizing China's uh, 
uh, higher education system. And also, of course, the graduate students, most of them also uh, return to China and all, or another way uh, to tr go back to China uh, periodically to help China. So I think this uh, myself, of course, is a good example uh, of the product of this uh, cooperation uh, from China. And um, I think the the obvious impact on China of those kind of cooperation in those 10 years was the first uh, enhanced uh, quality of higher education, it's improved the uh, research capacity of China, and most importantly, I think it, it cultivated a generation of uh, scholars and students have warm feeling about Canada. So this is really then later on, there's a strong economic tie uh, developed between the two countries. So I think this is also very mutual beneficial and it's really important. So this history showed, I think to me, so long the two sides uh, adhered the principles of a mutual respect and avoid uh, ideological or political interference, uh, the academic exchange and cooperation can benefit both sides. So thinking of this now, uh, look at today's uh, rather chilly relation between China and uh, Canada is uh, quite a uh, regret. So that's my my point. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tang. And Dr. Uh, Vail, um, you were not uh, that part of history, but you are making history. So can we uh, have your opinion? I, I, I think you're overestimating my uh, tiny little role here. Um, my, uh, let me just add, just echo what has been said so far, and uh, probably the Canadian audience might not know why uh, the name Norman Bethune is so important to explain the warm feelings that Chinese have towards Canada. I mean, every Chinese school kid um, learns in primary school uh, an essay that Chairman Mao wrote in memory of Norman Bethune. And because of that essay, he, where he shows he has a self-sacrificing spirit and a love of China is communicated through, through that essay. So that's one reason why there are such warm feelings. And even in the current Chile ties, frankly, um, that doesn't really affect that, that, the deeper uh, warm feelings, I think, among, or, among you know, ordinary people in, in China. I mean, when, when I'm in taxis and I mentioned I'm from Canada, uh, first I say, are you from the US? And then I, and then I say, no, I'm from Canada. I can visibly, there's a kind of relief. And then the, the right away they mention, Norman Bethune. Um, so I, I think that, and also Canada is viewed as a relatively small country in terms of population and global influence. So it's not viewed as a threat in any way. It's, and that's a bit like when, when we have dialogues I mentioned earlier with Nordic countries, um, also we, we have these less ideological dialogues where both sides really want to learn from each other. I think Canada has that position and I'm still hopeful that we can go through these difficult times and restore um, these dialogues based on the, the warm feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. And thank you all the panelists um, for your opinions and perspectives. So let's move on to uh, the second question uh, we have here. What can Canadian universities gain from working with their, with their Chinese counterparts? Do Canada-China university exchange and collaboration serve Canadian interests? Are there any major downsides, as some people even um, put um, pitfalls? Um, so this is the second question. Um, may I invite Dr. Tang to address it first? Well, thanks. Uh, I probably want to make two points. Uh, the first one is um, I have recently visited uh, a number of uh, top Chinese universities, such as the Tsinghua or Junyang University or Southern China University of Science Technology. And uh, I think they now all can be considered as world-class universities. I found out uh, their research in quite a few areas are very much advanced and they are all well funded. So I, I do believe Canadian universities certainly can benefit from like a, conducting joint research uh, or this kind of cooperation, uh, which will benefit the Canadian university if they do this uh, with their Chinese uh, counterpart. I think it's not the same as uh, what happened in 40 years ago, but at that time, of course, the Chinese uh, scholars or purely the uh, students now I think the, the, the situation changed. A second point I want to say is I understand uh, there are 
national security concern on Canadian side, uh, particularly from the government, which is uh, Dr. Chow, you mentioned earlier. I think similar things happened in, in quite a few Western countries, particularly American universities. I think it's understandable, uh, but we all know that the most of the research carried out by the, China, by the university are basic science research. And um, they come from, they, they, they normally, uh, uh, so that's why I think uh, I can, I, I see the voice uh, recently uh, from, although it's a still weak voice uh, from a Canadian or American university is uh, questioning the legitimacy of this kind of a national security uh, concern or claim. I think the, um, I, th I hope this kind of a rational voice will become louder and louder in order to push the authorities to uh, not to really uh, have that kind of control laid on this uh, Canadian and the Chinese uh, university exchanges. So because I, I still believe that uh, today, uh, Canadian university can also get a lot from the cooperation with the, their Chinese counterparts. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Um, Dr. Bell, uh, do you have anything to say? Um, well, I, I agree with what has been said. Let me just add that um, here we are in Shandong province, which is kind of the home culture of the Confucian tradition. And one of the less well-known parts about um, higher education in China is that there's been a huge revival of tradition and you have very rich and diverse debates about different traditions, including Confucianism. So I think if Canadians want to learn, which I think is about the rest of the world and about the social phenomena uh, in countries like China, it's very important to come to China to learn about those debates and to participate in those discussions, hopefully. Um, also more concretely, I mean here, at McGill University has had an exchange with Shandong University on healthcare and the ethics of healthcare. I mean, uh, Ch China has a lot to learn from Canada in that respect, but so does Canada. I mean, the way that we've dealt with the pandemic here, of course, after the early, uh, you know, not so debacle in, in, in um, Wuhan, but since then, the past year or so at least, China has done a remarkable job of dealing with the pandemic. Clearly, um, Canada... I think should learn from China's experience if there's a kind of open-minded approach to the, these issues about um, healthcare and, and global threats to health. Um, on other issues like um, artificial intelligence, I mean, on the one hand, it's a global problem how artificial intelligence threatens to up throw, throw many, make many people unemployed or how uh, artificial intelligence threatens to become more intelligent than humans. I mean, these are global debates and there are fascinating debates about the ethics of AI in China and how Chinese traditions shed light on those. I think Canada can and should join and participate and learn from those debates as well as, of course, China should learn from the debates in Canada as well. So there's a lot to learn. I mean, of course, there's a tiny area that might affect national security concerns, but it shouldn't be blanket. Uh, those concerns shouldn't be directed at China per se. I mean, it's fine for universities uh, in Canada to have uh, some sort of norms issued ideally at the federal level about national security concerns, and they should apply to all countries, not just to China. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Hehu, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just add um, a, a couple, uh, one point really. One of the themes of my work actually since 1992 is dialogue among civilizations. We started to say that before Huntington's clash. And I think for Western universities to learn the lessons of the rich Asian civilizations, China and Confucianism being a very, very important one in education and higher learning is just something very essential. We need to have diverse epistemologies. So Daniel Bell's work in introducing at a deep level some of the core Confucian ideas to an English speaking world is truly, truly valuable. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your sharing and inputs. Um, so uh, let's move on to our third question, uh, which actually uh, turns the table around. Uh, it goes uh, like, uh, what can Chinese universities continue to learn from their con uh, Canadian counterparts? So this time, can I uh, invite Professor Bell to respond to it first? 
<laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, even though I went to McGill University many years ago, I don't actually have that much experience in Canadian universities. But let me just say from what my students tell me when they go to Canada, they very much appreciate the lively and civil debates um, about controversial issues that are often, mm, let's say, submerged in, in a Chinese context. And it's not just because of formal protection of academic freedom, which is important, but also the informal norms um, of learning and improving through uh, vivid debate. I, I think that um, Chinese students, especially from Shandong province, where here we have a culture of modesty and humility, perhaps related to the Confucian heritage, um, which is good in a way because it makes people very hardworking and, and willing to learn, but sometimes it does get in the way of lively uh, intellectual exchanges. And I think if, if students from Shandong especially can go to Canada, I think it would be it would be excellent for those students. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Tang, um, what do you think? Well, I think after uh, like a 40 years efforts uh, uh, learning from the Western universities uh, and also uh, based on their own efforts, the performance of the uh, Chinese university has been, I think, greatly improved. Uh, but hundreds of uh, Chinese university are excellent and uh, a few can be considered a world-class world university. And they are leading in quite a number of uh, scientific uh, research area. Uh, but in a certain uh, science and technology area, even they have achieved uh, great uh, uh, achievements, but still um, they are fields they are left behind. When I've talked to the Chinese professors, uh, one size they, they, they are very proud of their progress in the last day, 20 years, but at the same time they are very much realistic. They say uh, we are still have a, a distance between ourselves and uh, uh, like uh, Western universities. So I think they are very keen to to learn. Another field, of course, this is uh, humanity and the social science. I think in these areas, so China still uh, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, room for improvement. And I can see one good example is uh, you, when you read uh, the thesis or so papers uh, written uh, about social science, you always see kind of a, uh, the old habit of China to have a, a big topic, but actually without saying much, it's a small paper. Uh, I think the in the Western uh, traditional research is the opposite. You, you do a small subject, but you do a big paper to do a very detailed uh, research. I think this is a need, uh, need help. But another thing is actually I want to say here, because I, I, I spent years in UNESCO, because we, we believe um, uh, this kind of a bilateral cooperation or academic uh, exchange should not be between two countries or countries, should not be only limited to just uh, exchange to uh, help each other in science technology. Uh, people to people's contact is also very important. This, you know, will help uh, people from different countries to understand other countries' uh, cultural, uh, understand their uh, political system, uh, understand uh, the, the civilization of other countries. So to me, this is also very important to keep the uh, uh, contact between Chinese and Canadian, univer Canadian universities. So in that case, which they can help uh, the mutual uh, understanding from both sides. This is also, to me, is quite important, uh, not less important than just a, a exchange in science and, top, uh, and technology fields. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Heho, I'm sure you have much to say about this question. I, I will keep it very short, though. Uh, I like to think in terms of history. So Canadian universities, or maybe a, in the modern period, really only go back to about 1840s, 50s. The Chinese, the first one is 1895, often recognized as Tianjin University, and then Beidou, 1898, and so on. And I think China's modern experience of integrating external models and then developing them into a Chinese way of thinking and so on uh, has been a really interesting 
and I think also with Canada in terms of how that worked out with Canada. Now we have a number of Canadian universities with influential Chinese leaders. How is that piece being integrated into the Canadian model? So I think how we develop our own ethos, but really deeply integrate uh, other traditions that have influenced us historically. Perhaps is one of the areas where China is still uh, learning and developing in very interesting ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, next question, uh, number four. Uh, how might uh, the current geopolitical shifts impact Canada-China higher education relations? And what institutional responses and strategies are appropriate in this context? I'd like to pose this question first to Dr. Heho. Well, thank you for giving me uh, the uh, air for this particular question. I can't help but thinking about my experience as a diplomat uh, in charge of education, culture and science at the Canadian Embassy from 89 to 91. And we all know it was a very difficult time uh, in terms of relationships between Canada, other Western countries and the Chinese government because of some of the events that happened around that time. So nobody came. I was in the embassy. No officials came from Canada. On the political level, there was a very strong geopolitical tension. But I'm so thankful that our government insisted on expanding our programs in education, science, and culture. So I helped set up Canadian study centers all over China. I expanded our program for Chinese to go to Canada for short-term study and develop courses uh, from 20 to 55 each year, and spent a lot of time traveling around communicating with television stations, radio stations, universities, and other cultural groupings in order to keep the dialogue open. And it was so important. We know in 1992, Deng Xiaoping went down to Shenzhen. It's a great moment in Chinese history. And he said, we are going to stay open. And of course, we know from there on, China just moved dramatically uh, towards embracing openness to the world and economic development and so on. So I really had a personal experience that we as scholars and educators and cultural people, even in severe times of political uh, tension, if we keep open our communication and we cooperate in all the ways that we're able to do, it creates a foundation for the future. So that's my belief now. The more we can do that, I hope Daniel Bell can get more Canadian students to come to Shandong. What a great experience where the birthplace of Confucius and so on is. And that more Canadian, uh, Chinese students can come to Canada and scholars and exchange. So keeping those channels open is absolutely crucial uh, for ongoing cooperation once the geopolitical issues have been sorted out. Thank you, Ruth. So, uh, Dr. Bell, how do you feel? Well, I don't have a lot to add. That was beautiful. Um, I just said, uh, um, in these difficult times, we, we it's so important. And it, it's worth keeping in mind that, um, at least among academics, the desire for openness and communication is just so widespread in, in China. Um, that and and no matter what happens at the higher levels of politics, so um, we definitely need to keep because if we do close those channels, it's going to affect um, the academics and reformers who would otherwise be on 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 the same side on many of these issues. So it's so important to keep. I also teach a course at Schwarzman College in, um, in 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 which is meant to train future leaders from around the world at Tsinghua University. And every year we have some Canadians, some of whom go back to very pretty high level jobs in, in Canada. Um, and it's very important to keep uh, that open as well. Although I, I worry that because of these political tensions, it's, it's going to be harder to attract students. But I hope that my uh, worries are not well founded. And as soon as the borders open again, which I hope will be soon, I will definitely come to Canada and try to promote more ties. And I hope to draw on the experts on this panel for help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tang, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I want to uh, echo what uh, Professor Heho just mentioned. Uh, she mentioned uh, those uh, Chile uh, period uh, during uh, about 1990, 91, 92. Um, but then, of course, um, uh, I, I, I was on the Chinese side 
uh, in the Ministry of Education. There's one story. Uh, I follow the Vice Minister of Education to visit the United States as a, a kind of APAC uh, ministerial uh, meeting. Uh, by that time, there's some, not much bilateral uh, cooperation in education, nothing at all between China and the United States. But I was the, I joined the delegation as experts of a technical vocational education. And the Secretary of uh, Education of the United States, I think he's, by that time it was uh, Mr. Alexander, uh, he, ho he hosted a banquet for all the participants and he well, uh, agreed everybody. So when I entered the room, he, he, he asked me, are you Chinese? I said, yes. And then he, but he said, what area are you working? I said, technical vocation education. Then he started talking about uh, technical vocation education with me and then said, uh, why don't you um, uh, come to visit our ministry to talk about uh, technical vocation education? So maybe some uh, things we can work together. Uh, so the next day, the Chinese embassy sent their uh, first secretary to visit uh, the, the State Department, which is, has been uh, stopped uh, uh, for for years. So you can see, uh, so long this kind of, uh, as uh, Professor Hayhoe just said, uh, if we keep dialogue, we can always can do a step by step. And then sooner or later, I think we will can we can overcome. Uh, these kind of difficulties. But the last thing I want to mention here is uh, I think China probably at this stage should try to provide more opportunities to attract a more uh, students from uh, Western countries. And of course, as uh, Professor Bell, this is not very easy at the time being because the negative image of China. But I, I think we still have to try. I think uh, we do need a new generation of we call China hands, just like uh, Professor Heiho, like uh, Professor Bell, uh, the new generation who can understand Chinese culture, history, and the reality. So this should be the uh, for the benefit, the long run of the relationship between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have the, the final question. Um, how do Canada-China University Exchange and collaboration look in the global higher education landscape? How can Canadian and Chinese universities work together and better to tackle all the pressing issues concerning university resilience and societal uncertainties? Are there any specific current examples that may point the way? Uh, so this is our last question. I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Tang. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I worked for UNESCO uh, for 25 years, so, so I'm very much uh, uh, devoted to the uh, concept uh, of UNESCO. I think UNESCO views education as a, I would call a global common good, which means uh, that um, the higher education has a a key role to play in using the knowledge and uh, educational common to empower the humankind uh, to deal with those global challenges. I think uh, the recent uh, fighting of COVID-19 uh, showed that uh, what scientific communities can do uh, together uh, can be mobilized together, supported by the government, private sectors, and uh, to show this kind of global responsibilities. So it shows that the global solidarity really uh, can do uh, when the fundamental issues uh, for the future of humankind uh, are at stake. So for this reason, uh, UNESCO has been pushing the international cooperation and exchanges uh, among universities for decades. Uh, but it's very unfortunate to see the recent um, uh, uh, kind of a Chile uh, relation between China and uh, Canadian universities. And uh, very regrettable, particularly when we had this uh, very global, uh, gl glory history, I put it that way. But anyway, the good thing is that I think universities uh, have a tradition of uh, supporting uh, the principle of open science and uh, open access to knowledge. Uh, so academic people normally consider their product can be a, a shareable or shareable goods, uh, which can contribute to progress in science. So I think it's a, a common knowledge that um, most scientific research uh, conducted in the university is a basic uh, scientific research. Uh, so the uh, we should um, not uh, have this, um, we call, uh, uh, security uh, concern be artificially exaggerated. Uh, so then they can hinder the academic freedom. 
uh, in the universities. I think it's uh, uh, in, in Chinese universities today, they have, uh, as I mentioned, they have a lot of uh, things uh, very advanced and well funded. Uh, so such cooperation between uh, Chinese and Canadian university definitely will benefit both sides. Uh, but anyway, it's very encouraging to see recently, I read the news uh, in Canada, this University of Alberta uh, has avoided some kind of a uh, position uh, which uh, insisted the cooperation uh, on the academic cooperation with China. I think um, we hope, uh, you know, the Canadian government also can follow. Uh, I'll take the decision with the common sense. Uh, so then this uh, kind of a uh, mutual beneficial uh, cooperation between Chinese and Canadian university can be maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bell, do you have any point to share? Um, I mean, I, I agree. So the de facto bias should be in favor of cooperation. And if there are any fears, they need to be very well demonstrated. And, and it shouldn't be applied just in the case of China, but in the case of all countries. Um, in terms of specific examples, I mean, I mentioned that we, Shandong University has a, an exchange with McGill University has had, and it's been going on for many years on the ethics of healthcare. I mean, it's so topical now. And that sort of thing is obviously mutually beneficial for Canada and China. So, I mean, as far as I can see, almost all areas of cooperation that I see uh, are, are mutually beneficial and we should encourage them, but we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll leave uh, time for Professor Heho, who has much more to say on this than I do. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Heho. Thank you, so, thank you so much. I'll just make a very brief comment too, so we can leave time for questions. Um, I just want to mention, I think the BRI initiative and all the ways that uh, China is supporting the region through it needs much more educational focus. So what I've been trying to encourage, I have many Chinese scholars coming here as visiting doctoral students or scholars and then going back, is to stimulate the Chinese universities rather than trying to follow global ranking and catch up with the world and of course they have caught up and gone beyond in many cases to really see the interest of working with uh, developing countries. And perhaps Canada and China can together work on these things. Uh, and now it's so much more possible. I know, Chang, you're working with students in Kenya who are refugees. Can't we do that together between Canadian and Chinese universities? Online is doing through the BRA where there's considerable funding available. So let me end with that point so we can leave time for any questions. Thank you. Thank you all um, for your inputs and sharing. So now we have, uh, we do have um, a few minutes um, to get questions from the the, the audience. Let's see. Um, okay, so we have a question now. Are there any circumstances where educational cultural exchange should be suspended? Um, so who would like to take this question first? First. Uh, well, no, let me just. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Ho. Go ahead. I, I would just say I have a little concern over the area of A and I and the use of extensive uh, surveillance uh, of citizens, and so that's one of the areas. But I'm totally unknowledgeable in the area, so I can't say more than that. I just have a little concern around that. And the legal issues related to it in terms of human freedom. And Dr. Bell, you are working uh, on the frontiers. So how do you feel? Um, well, I, I think that there are the circumstances. I mean, we can spell them out in general ways where um, cooperation leads to immoral results. For example, helps to facilitate gross violations of human rights. I mean, if that's the case, then obviously the cooperation should be suspended. But those general rules should not be directed at a country in particular. They should apply to all areas of cooperation in all different countries. And if they happen to apply in the case of China, then yes, I mean, they should be suspended. But again, we need to spell out those circumstances in a very general way and make sure that it's not directed at one country. If it's directed at one country, it just seems, it, well, it just seems unfair, but also it ha could have potentially bad results for uh, for Chinese Canadians, I mean, who, who who are also viewed as part of this threat. I mean, it's very, very dangerous what has happened in, in the province of Alberta, as far as I could tell. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tao, do you have anything to add? Well, I think this, uh, now this is kind of a political thing, but actually in UNESCO, when I worked there, we, we faced a lot of uh, actually political challenges uh, among member states. You know, sometimes, like for example, between Israel and uh, Palestine. And of course, uh, the, politically, it's a lot of a uh, reason for each other, to, for them to suspend their uh, cooperation in cultural education, but same. But for UNESCO, we are trying to say, uh, even for political reason, you don't want to d have a dialogue. At least uh, through cultural or education, you can do something non-politically to maintain the contact between the two countries. So at least this is a kind of a contribution to the peace. At least what you can do is uh, avoid this uh, political interference and use the culture and also education as to maintain the momentum. So someday you can get back the political uh, cooperation between the two sides. So to us, uh, we always try, we never give up the, the hope. We always try to continue uh, to promote this cooperation uh, between the two countries, even they're uh, fighting each other. Thank you. Yeah, next question. Let's speak about the present. Uh, the freedom of speech at the present in Canadian universities is under attack. You should be attacked, right? Um, what is the uh, censorship at universities in China? So who would like to uh, maybe uh, can invite uh, Dr. Bell? How do you feel? Um, well, it's uh, I guess it's not it's quite well known that um, the there has been somewhat increased censorship of late and it affects especially not the teaching so much um, the teaching is we I mean I teach in political theory where so f where it's remarkably free to express different views but when it comes to publishing in Chinese the sphere of what's considered to be acceptable is narrowing and that makes it harder for our teachers. So actually, our teachers are rewarded for publishing outside of, well, publishing in English in, in, in uh, SSCI, in ranked journals that are refereed. Um, the, the problem with that, of course, is that they have to write in English, which is a challenge for them. But this is where the exchanges with Canada can help, because if teachers can spend some time in Canada, they could improve their English, have more time for academic exchanges in Canada and, and we'll be able to publish more um, in uh, English language journals outside of China. Thank you. Um, Dr. Heho, do you have anything to add? Uh, just very briefly, I heard from one or two scholars in China how they became disturbed when they were invited to drink tea, which means they were called out because they said something in class which was recorded by the surveillance that was considered to be um, unacceptable uh, politically. So I think it is a little bit tense, but I'm always amazed at how much um, discourse there is that is very rich. Uh, and I, I still meet with students quite often and see that still going on. So I'm thankful for that. Dr. Just to echo that um, very quickly, the, the substance of the discourse of the debates, arguably, I mean, this is a controversial claim, but I'd be prepared to defend it, especially in my field, is richer typically than, than the kind of informal or de facto limits that you often have in politically correct discourses in the West. But in this, kind of, excuse the polemics, I'll just end here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tan, do you have any comment? No, I'm not in position to make comments. I think that's fine. Okay. So do we have a next question? Uh, I do see time is up, but just in case we have uh, more questions. Um, if not, um, and actually time is up. Uh, so I'd like to invite um, all the panelists to say a few words or a few sentences uh, as their concluding remarks, just briefly. And um, can I invite um, Dr. Tang first? Uh, um, I think uh, after this, I want to say uh, um, we should be confident. And even today's uh, uh, rather cold geopolitical environment, uh, but I still I haven't lost my confidence because I 
as uh, we just discussed earlier, we we experienced the uh, the chilly period uh, in 1990s, but in the end, we all overcome the uh, these difficulties. So so long we we are, are you know uh, we do um, whatever we can to uh, to contribute this uh, uh, continuous uh, cooperation between the two country two year countries universities, and uh, certainly I think in the end the common sense will prevail over other considerations. So I'm still very um, confident on the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Heho. Thank you for this opportunity to be here and be with all of you. I feel specially honored. I haven't had a chance to personally meet uh, Dr. Tang or Dr. Daniel Bell, but I know they work very well in their contribution. And I feel very honored to be a part of the panel. And I share with Dr. Tang the sense of hope. I do believe we have a firm foundation in 50, 60 years of history. I know last year was the 50th anniversary of Canada-China establishing relationships. And I do believe there is so much more to learn and benefit through educational and cultural cooperation in the future with our universities on both sides. So finally, Dr. Bell. I'm, uh, thank you. I'm moved by the optimism uh, by um, Dr. Tang and Dr. Heho. And, and actually, frankly, I was a bit depressed before this dialogue, not just because of the chilly climate, be because of the fact that the Montreal Canadiens have suffered a bad loss to the Maple Leafs. But anyway, um, <laughs> now I'm, I'm happy and optimistic, and I look forward to the future and more cooperation. Thank you. Thank and, you all. So um, on behalf of the organizers, um, and Massey College and the Canada China Initiatives Fund at York University. I'd like to thank you for your participation, for your sharing, and for your contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. <laughs>